Hi, I'm Fran Mayer and welcome to another Napa Institute webcast. Mary Rice Hassan is an attorney, a nationally respected author and lecturer, and the Cato Byrne Fellow in Catholic Studies at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, DC. Mary is also the director of the Catholic Women's Forum, a network of Catholic professional women and scholars seeking to amplify the voice of Catholic women in support of human dignity, authentic freedom, and Catholic social teaching. Mary's work focuses in a special way on topics related to women, faith, culture, family, sexual morality, and gender ideology. The Knapp Institute is also fortunate to have Mary as a member of its board, so it's a special delight to welcome her today. Mary, thanks for being with us for this conversation. Thanks so much, Fran. It's wonderful to have this conversation with you. Mary, uh, people are all over the lot in terms of their understanding of the kinds of territory that you cover in your scholarship. Uh, they're particularly unfamiliar with the actual content of something like gender ideology, that terminology. Uh, so what does it mean? I mean, uh, what makes gender ideology an ideology and what's the difference between sex and gender? Yeah, I think the simple way to understand gender ideology is to think of it as a worldview, as an anthropology, because it's a vision of the human person that is radically at odds with the Christian vision of the human person, and, and even the vision of the human person proposed by natural law. And so we became familiar, I think, as a culture with this term, gender ideology, really um, through the papacy of, of Pope Francis, because even though Pope Benedict had spoken about this alternative worldview. He didn't kind of put those two words together and call it gender ideology. But, but Pope Francis early on uh, warned about gender ideology as being um, wicked, as being a global war on marriage and the family. And at the same time, Pope Francis has reached out to persons who are who are struggling with issues about identity and or who might identify as transgender. So as Catholics, we've got to put those two things together and understand the ideology piece of it even um, even before we start talking about the difference between sex and gender. And and in terms of ideology, I think it's important to think of it as a system of beliefs and a set of beliefs that has its own premises. And these premises are radically different from, uh, from Christianity. Be, and, and the chief thing that Pope Benedict had mentioned and Pope Francis as well, is that gender ideology sees the person as self-defining. The person is self-creating. In other words, there's no room for a creator who's created us uh, because he loves us. Our dignity comes from being loved and created by God but who are created according to a design, that there's a way that we're made and that we should live. And gender ideology puts all of that in the hands of, of the individual person. You get to create yourself. And, and there's more to it than that, but, but let me just throw that out there uh, for starters. What does, the, what does the expression gender transition actually mean? I mean, it's, an, it's almost an antiseptic way of uh, putting things, but what's actually involved and does it ever really work? Yeah, no, great question. So to go back to, you know, the tail end of your, your first question, what's the difference between sex and gender? So when I mentioned that gender ideology is a different worldview, a different anthropology, a different vision of the person, we understand the person as being unity of body and soul. So we're created male and female. Gender ideology, on the other hand, says that your body is just one aspect, one dimension that is under the control of your will, that who you are really depends on your feelings. And so what has become popular and what most people are probably familiar with through the culture is not just the idea of gender, which many people sort of conflate with the idea of sex, male, female, but this idea of gender identity. In other words, who I am is defined by my feelings about whether I'm male, female, man, woman, both, neither, something else. And those feelings are often uh, determined by comparing yourself to stereotypical notions about uh, roles that males and females have had through the culture. So sex is something that's fixed. It's, it's biology. It's our, our, who we are according to our reproductive role, and that's across species. So our whole body's organization towards a reproductive role, that's what makes us male and female. You can't change it. It's in every sex of, I mean, every cell of your body is imprinted with this identity. 
But along comes gender ideology and says, sex is not really significant. What matters is your feeling that again, separating this idea of body and soul unity, the person who is um, who has bought into gender ideology believes that my body is really a tool that I can use in any way to carry out that, that will or in, interior conviction that I have. And that what matters is that the person's feelings are given expression and that the law and the culture makes room for the person to define their own reality and their own concept of, of um, human life. So you had asked about gender transitions. What happens is the, the person that we, uh, who identifies as transgender is someone whose body is male or female, but their feelings say, no, I reject that. I'm, I'm, that's not who I am. I identify as someone else, whether it's the opposite sex or whether, um, and now there are hundreds of identities. You could be gender queer, gender fluid, you know, all these different things. And someone who identifies then as transgender rejects the reality of being male or female and takes steps to express or live out this alternative um, identity. And those steps, this idea of transition can be social. It's purely external, your hair, your clothes, your name. Uh, it could be medical, which we can talk about at more length, but medical, surgical, but also legal, where you change your documents and your birth certificate erases the fact that you were born male and now is going to read that your gender is something else, female or, or X or, or something else. So transition is this idea that the person who's rejected the, the biological truth of who they are and has adopted or, or wants to express a different identity is going to make changes in their lives to live that new identity out. And they're, what they're looking for is affirmation and validation from the culture at large, from every person they encounter. So that's the idea of transition. And we can, we can talk um, a little bit more about kind of those stages, but also the success and, and how to think about. Yeah, really Mary, it seems that, that, that what you're describing seems to be a, a kind of trigger of not only social and cultural confusion, but real personal confusion, I mean, personal harm. Would you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and for, it, there have always been some people who were confused or experienced mm -hmm. these desires to be someone different and, and rejecting their body, but really not until the sexual revolution and external political pressures came about was this thought of as anything but mental illness. In other words, to identify in a way that rejects your, your body, your bodily identity, people understood that's uh, that, that there was something uh, not healthy about that, to be at war, literally, interiorly, to be divided in terms of your, your body is, is who you are, and yet you're rejecting that and you're, you're trying to live something else. So um, the psychological community, unfortunately, has buckled to political pressure and changed the diagnostic descriptions and the codes that apply to people who are suffering from these things. So it used to be called gender, well, it went from being called transsexual. There were a small number of people, usually older men, who would experience this discordance with their body and, and their desires. And when surg surgical techniques became available, principally in the 50s, 60s, um, they sought surgery to sort of remake who they were. And yet it was still considered a mental illness. It wasn't until this political pressure came along in the 70s and then later in the 80s, they uh, changed the description to gender identity disorder. And then that was considered still stigmatizing because of the word disorder. So now the psychological community looks at it and says, the, there's nothing wrong with the identity. So the only thing that can be diagnosed is gender dysphoria. If you experience distress over this mismatch between body and identity. So, so that's, that's what we've seen in terms of psychology, but the promise that was held out was that if we just get rid of the stigma, if we just uh, get rid of 
you know, telling people that this is not normal, that it's somehow better to have this unity between your, your mind and, and your body, then everything will be fine. And in reality, that just has not been the case. And, you know, I, I think that's something I'd want to emphasize here, Fran, is that the people I know who have or continue to struggle with this and their families experience great suffering and, and great difficulty because, because there's an internal division. Mm -hmm. And the attempt to modify the body in order to validate the feelings can only work for a time. And so what we see when we look at studies that have been done, uh, not so much with children who are going through this, because that's, that's more of a, a new phenomenon, but with adults who have taken steps to alter the body through medication, hormones, or surgery, is that in the long haul, even if they experience an initial euphoria or a sense that, wow, I've finally got what I want, in the long haul, they continue to have high suicide rates. They continue to have high rates of mental health issues. Um, and you know, there's a wound there that, that can't be fixed mm -hmm. by hormones or by surgery. You really have to figure out and answer the question, well, why? You know, why? What's, what down deep is happening to make someone want to reject their body and then to take all these steps that are really going to destroy function, destroy fertility, um, make them dependent for the rest of their lives on, on medication and medical help. So, uh, Mary, the, the, uh, I want to go back to the historical roots of this for just a moment because it's always struck me as it seems it, there's a certain logical sense for me that um, the uh, the breakdown of the family, for example, and the breakdown of uh, sensible relations, but sexual relations between men and women can flow out of the development of the contraceptive pill. I mean, the, blaming everything on the contraceptive pill obviously doesn't work, but nonetheless, it was a very important trigger. But I honestly don't see how we got to this point from that point. I mean, why? how did this become such a significant social debate issue uh, in such a short time in American culture. Yeah, so there are two things going on. One, conceptually, they are linked because once you you look at the person and you separate the idea of sex and reproduction, then the question is, well, what difference does it make where your sexual desires are oriented? Mm -hmm. But you get the flip side of that and he says that says, well, what difference does it make what kind of body I have because what matters is what I choose, what I desire. Mm -hmm. So it it really is rooted in that phenomenon of instead of looking at the person, accepting that as sexual beings, we're male or female, we're oriented towards a reproductive role, males and females, one for another, and that from the, the meeting of male and female, we get, we get children, that that's intrinsic to who we are, whether or not we actually go on to have children, that's, that's part of our makeup, our identity. But as a culture, we've forgotten that sex has something to do with reproduction that being male or female has something to do with that reproductive role. And just as we've forgotten that uh, sexual activity has something to do with reproduction. So once you erase that, then you sort of have a free for all, which is really what our children are being taught in schools now that who they are is whoever they determine themselves to be. Who they love is wherever their feelings direct them to be. What kind of family they establish is really a result of those feelings and, and those desires. So you've, you've sort of taken out the whole foundation of the family. Once, once you deny the truth about who we are as a person, and then you deny the truth that we're oriented, males and females, one for another, just looking at our, our bodily design, and you deny those two things, then you, you're also denying the family. And so that's, that's exactly what we're seeing. But you asked, you know, why why are we seeing all this and, and how has this taken root? I mean, one of the problems has been that as the culture as a whole has forgotten this truth about who we are, you know, and I think many people my age and, and older, you didn't have to necessarily state things, these things clearly because when the culture was pulling everyone in the right direction, the, certain things were implicit, but we're in a very different culture. We're in a culture that is repudiating the truth about who we are. So to the younger generation, we have to be explicit about explaining. We're, we're created, we're created beings. There's a design to who we are. We're created for relationship. We're males and females and science 
you know, supports faith and reason are, are completely compatible. You know, our science tells us you cannot change sex. So even when somebody uh, has these feelings of identifying in a different way and wants to take steps by hormones or, or surgery, you know, as a lawyer, I look at things like the informed consent documents. And on the informed consent documents, they don't talk about changing someone's sex because you can't. Mm -hmm. about feminizing or masculinizing the appearance of the body by introducing hormones that are not natural to the body, that they're, they're designed to induce a different effect. So, so this is, has been promoted partly because of an ideological embrace of a different vision of who we are. But then you have a lot of other elements coming in, whether it's the pharmaceutical companies, there's a profit to be made from this, yeah. the medical establishment there. We went from in 2007, there was one gender clinic for children. There are now over 65 just in the U.S. You know, so people, there are all these other motivations come in. And then um, we've had the corporations getting behind this because it's part of woke ideology. And, and it's just being pushed. It's, it's just flooding the culture. And, and unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of it seep into the church and where people are getting mixed up about who we are and, and what it means to be compassionate to people who are struggling with. That's the next question. I mean, how do you, you come at this from a, a, a uniquely Catholic perspective? So what are the moral principles that we're supposed to apply in a situation like this? And how can we simultaneously speak about the truth of who we are and exercise compassion toward people who disagree with us? It seems to be almost an impossible task. Well, it, it is, it's a huge, huge issue. And, and I think that's one of the things that, again, Pope Francis has emphasized. And I think our own bishops are, are really seeing that if you get the idea of who we are as a person wrong, a whole lot of things fall apart because of that. How do you talk about, how do you do just basic catechesis, Christ becoming man? What meaning does that have in a culture that no longer believes there is such a thing as a man or a woman, that it really depends on how you, how you identify, you know, so, so this is foundational to our faith. Um, and, and how it has spread has been these cultural influences. And again, the, the medicine, the politics, but through the education system. So it's, it's huge and it's really troubling. And I forget what your, what was the exact question you were, you were honing in on there? Well, oh, passion. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so you asked about you know, compassion. If this is a radically different conception of the human person. And so there's a huge stake in getting it right and also pushing back against laws and policies that are trying to institutionalize this into the culture and disrupt the foundation of the family. How do you be compassionate to people who are dealing with this? And, and so a couple of things, I, I think, one, we affirm the dignity of the person as a person created by God. So every person has dignity. We're not, we're not denying that, but your dignity doesn't lie in your expression of a desired identity or a feeling. Mm -hmm. It's something deeper. It can't be taken away from you. you know, your dignity is that you're created by God, love forever, and called to live with him for, for all eternity. You were, I mean, that's an amazing thing. You can be the worst person in the world and you have human dignity. I think one of the most disturbing things about this, Mary, is... Um, I remember reading in After Virtue, Alistair McIntyre's point about we live in an emotivist culture. And listening to what you're saying, it really strikes me that um, so much of this is illogical and that logic doesn't even fit into it because emotions are what are driving the whole thing. You know, if I feel something, it must be true. I can't be denied it. And, and that's not something to build a culture on, it seems to me, let alone a political order. Right. No, and, and you're exactly right. This is very much morally relativistic, but even, even detached from um, the truth about nature and, and what our senses can tell us and, and what we can discover. They're very driven by feelings. And, and because of that, and because there are people who are clearly suffering and clearly struggling because of these issues, I think sometimes people, whether in Catholic circles or Christian circles, get drawn into a false compassion. 
So they say, I see this suffering person before me and we can never forget you know, the, the individuals who are struggling and I want to be kind. I want to affirm them. And what they're asking of me is that I affirm them in this identity. And we have to be able to say, I love you. I love you unconditionally. And you have dignity. And I'm going to affirm your, your worth and your value and your dignity because I know who you are. And God made you and loved you. And, and you're worthy of that. But I'm not going to affirm you in living a lie. And there is a truth about who we are. You know, our fundamental identity has got to be as a son or daughter of the Lord. And it's, we can't, uh, there, there's so much at stake in just accepting that, that basic fact. But I think too, Mary, though, that some of this is the fruit of just generations of being told not to impose our views on other people. I mean, people, in, it seems to me a lot of Catholics that I know um, are, are, you know, they're good people, but they really don't want to fight because they have been trained essentially that disagreeing uh, is an imposition of one's views. And uh, it seems to me that that only leads to a really negative situation in terms of the inability of the church to witness at all on these matters. Yeah, and we don't do it any service to the person who's suffering because lots of times people say, well, you don't, you can't judge someone. Well, we're not judging them in terms of, of their final destiny and we're not even saying they're a bad person maybe they're maybe they're confused but there is a truth about the situation that we need to speak so it's a false compassion that tries to make someone feel better in the short term with little regard for the long-term harm that may result and so when someone is suffering from this identity confusion the immediate short-term compassion is, I want to make them feel better. They're asking for hormones. They're asking me to use this pronoun. I'm going to do that because they will feel better. And yet, when you affirm them in that lie, you're, you're helping them go down a path that is nothing more than a dead end. And they are never going to find the peace that they're seeking. And in um, working with people who've, who've struggled with these issues and their families, one of the things, especially young women who have gone through these transitions and still suffered mental health problems and then finally got the mental health problems addressed and detransitioned, in other words, they kind of came out on the other side, you listen to them and, and they say that because they were chasing that affirmation and validation externally, they became so hyper-focused and obsessed on whether someone was gendering them correctly or misgendering them mm -hmm. or whether they were passing. Could people tell if you're a young man who's identifying as a female and you're wearing a dress, can people tell that you're really a male? It becomes an obsession. So it, it's, not, it's not healthy, but in the long term, you're encouraging someone when you affirm that you're encouraging someone to live a life that's fundamentally untrue and where you're you're committing to being at war with yourself you're taking the opposite sex hormones you're taking surgery to cut off your body parts and to reshape and fashion new ones and that are never going to work the way they're supposed to and you're destroying your natural function and this continues and continues and continues you know, there. So it's a um, it's a mistake for those of us who love someone who's experiencing this to think that you're you're being kind and compassionate by affirming them or facilitating them down a path that simply cannot lead them to happiness. You know, Mary, as a parent, uh, it strikes me as being especially egregious that any parent would encourage a minor to do this at a point in the minor's life where the minor has really a very malformed sense of who he or she is. I mean, could you talk a little bit about, I, I was struck by your comment about 65, 65 clinics now that deal with minor transition. That just sounds insane to me. I mean, uh, how is that even justified? I mean, what, what kind of science supports that? Well, there isn't science. I mean, this, what has happened is there was a political decision that decided they were not going to treat the situation where someone identifies in a way at odds with their body, in other words, a transgender identity. That was no longer path pathological, but also in terms of treatment, that it was no longer going to be preferred to help someone integrate their feelings with their identity. In other words, the psychology took this stance that said, it's just fine 
for a person's feelings to match their body or not match their body. We're not going to say one is better than the other. That's as if a doctor who specialized in cancer said, we're going to step back and say it's neither better nor worse to help a person's cancer cells be eradicated from their body or, or you know, help them find healing. We're, we're just not going to make a judgment, but that's, that's what's happening. So with children, what we're seeing is that generally they learn about this whole idea that they can choose who they want to be by either school, where these concepts are introduced, or by social media, or now just children's media, children's books and, and uh, children's TV has introduced all these characters. And the lie that our children are told is that who they are is up to them. It depends on their feelings. You know, and I often think, I, I think back to when our kids were young and, and one of our kids um, used to wake up every day, no matter whether it was February or July, and say, is it a pants day or a shorts day? Because the world is full of possibilities. Mm -hmm. And it was up to us as adults to help him make sense of the world, the rhythms of the world. But today, when young children wake up, and, and they, uh, especially younger children, they see something they like, toys, and that's, quote, a boy toy. Well, does that make them a boy? Are they, and, and is an adult saying, oh, you're interested in the boy toys. So maybe are you identifying as a boy? So adults, some adults, you know, <laughs> really? on the wrong path, it's, it's unfortunately true. And, and the odd thing here is that, you know, I grew up at a time when women were trying to get rid of stereotypes, right? We were trying to say, hey, we're just women. Let us do what we can do according to our talents and interests. And now our children are being encouraged to look at stereotypical things, interests, colors, activities, clothes, and decide their identity by how well they match or fit those stereotypes, which is just a backwards step. Um, but, but the other thing that, that's happening, we're seeing the greatest explosion in the number of kids who are identifying as transgender or non-binary among adolescents, you know, which is a time of, of natural, um, discomfort, psychological searching, and especially for girls, just really difficult uh, times of accepting your body and, and embracing what that means and a woman's cycle and, and all these things. So body discomfort is not that unusual. But now our children are, can learn on the internet or learn at school that if you're uncomfortable with your body and your interests are not the stereotypical boy or girl interests. We've got a solution for that. That's the cause of your unhappiness. You will find happiness if you embrace this other identity. This means you are transgender. And we're gonna we're gonna encourage you to embrace that. And so there's something called the gender affirming approach to therapy, which has been adopted here in the US that tells teachers, social workers, counselors, doctors, that when a child expresses uh, either a discomfort with their body or a preference for to identify in a different way, the adults only, only response should be to affirm, not to ask why. Why is it so scary to think of yourself as growing from a girl to be a woman? That opens up a lot of great conversations, but instead you're supposed to say to a young girl who says, this isn't, I don't feel like a girl. I must be, I'm, I'm a boy. I identify as a boy. You're supposed to say, you're right. That just sounds to me like a complete subversion of language. That expression, gender affirming healthcare, mm -hmm. is something right out of George Orwell. Yeah, I mean, it is. It, it, is. Masks, it masks an entire world of potential big problems. Yeah, and even to the point that in children's um, educational programs, they now have what's called gender-inclusive puberty education. So puberty talks about the development of our bodies as male and female. Well, they erase male and female. So you only have bodies with parts. Mm -hmm. So you have people who have ovaries, not females, but people who have ovaries experience you know, periods, et cetera. And so children are being taught under the guise of science just lies about their bodies as if any person just might randomly happen to have ovaries. And the reason why they do this is because then it normalizes the idea down the road that a child who doesn't like their body and, for example, wants to get rid of, rid of their breasts and, and um, have surgery to acquire male 
genitals or pseudo -genital genitals, that that's just as normal, that these are just parts that are can be replaced and identity is something up here. Has nothing to do with Mary, some of the sharpest questions and some of the harshest criticism of the, the this transgender moment uh, have come from women. Why is that? I think it's because of this idea that um, women have asserted our identities you know, from the feminist movement mm -hmm. um, for what, 50 years now and fought long and hard to have laws that permit us to uh, participate fully as women in society. But at the same time, we've also been able to keep a zone of privacy and safety that recognizes something particular about women's vulnerability. You know, women are nine out of 10 sexual assault victims are, are women. Anyone could be a sexual assault victim, but women are uniquely vulnerable. And yet when you erase this idea that being male or female means anything, that it's, it's just how you identify. Well, then you get the situation that they're experiencing in Canada and the UK, where they're already down this road, where in female prisons, for example, you have men who have been sex predators, uh, child abusers, who are incarcerated and then identify as women. And they ask to be put in the women's prisons. Well, we know what happens then. Then women get assaulted. So right now at this time, we're, there's kind of a unique coalition that's been built between radical feminists who say, no, there's, uh, don't erase our sex-based rights. You know, there we fought long and hard for those. And people of faith who say there's there's a truth about who we are. People who are simply um, biological rigorous. You know, they they want the truth, and they say no, you cannot change sex, and it really means something that your bodies are different, and society should take that into account. And so you have this this very interesting coalition that has come together to push back against the transgender agenda. But the, it's pretty formidable out there because even, even uh, some of the state laws that have been proposed to limit the ability of the medical community to perform medical transitions on children younger than 18, right? To put them on puberty blockers, which literally arrests their development, yeah. stops their bone growth, um, affects their executive functioning, and 98% of the time puts them on that path towards cross-sex hormones and, and further transition. Even something like that, which you would say is common sense. Don't, you know, maybe you think it's okay for adults to do this to their bodies, but don't allow adults to do something to kids that's going to have just lifelong impact when a child can't even understand what that is. There's been such pushback to that with the usual labels and you're a bigot, you're a transphobe. And yet people, common sense tells you, you why should a 13 year old girl yeah. operate it on and given a double mastectomy? Because yeah. she it feels is. uncomfortable in her body. We Mary, uh, I remember uh, this is 20 years ago or so. I mean, Yuval Levin wrote a wonderful book on social science where he, um, where he makes the distinction between the credibility of the hard sciences like um, physics, chemistry, and biology, right? And the social sciences. And one of the points that he made was the, um, was the vulnerability of the social sciences precisely to the kind of political manipulation that you've been talking about uh, in, uh, in this interview and elsewhere too. I mean, the fact that psychologists tell you something does not necessarily mean it's, it's you know, uh, it's absolutely accurate. It certainly doesn't have the same kind of credibility as biology or chemistry or physics. Right. And a troubling development has been that uh, a number of the medical schools have become woke and Harvard is leading the way. They have a program that is meant to familiarize med students with what they call transgender medicine. And but it's teaching this false vision of the person and it's encouraging these physicians to put aside not just common sense, but their own scientific knowledge about the difference between male and female bodies. That was that was an advance. Right, 20 years ago when they started acknowledging that women's bodies and diagnoses and, and manifestations of certain diseases and illnesses were different from, from men because our, our bodies are different. So they're teaching in, in the med school that 
sex doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. If what matters is to validate a person's gender identity and then to learn techniques, you take an um, anatomy inventory instead of looking at the person and saying, well, this is obviously a woman because this person's female. And instead you just, you make no assumptions and you let the person identify who they are. And then you take an inventory of which organs they still have or don't have. I mean, it's, it's crazy stuff. It, it, it's, uh, it's a corruption of mm -hmm. medicine and science, but it's been just pushed forward by ideology that has just taken over uh, so many of our cultural institutions. Mary, one final question, and that is, um, and particularly since you've been involved in Napa Institute for so long and know it so well, one of the things that the Napa Institute is focused on is empowering and informing lay people to actually make a difference in the culture. So what, I mean, what would you recommend that uh, people who see this interview, people who are involved in the Napa Institute, what can they do? How can they remain informed? What should they read? I mean, how, how can they play a role in trying to heal the culture? Great question. I, and I think it's, um, it's incumbent on all of us to play that role in healing the culture. So the first thing I'd say is go to a new website that I and several colleagues have started. It's called personandidentity.com. And what we've done is we've gathered church documents, but also medical research. Uh, we have FAQs, toolkits for parents, for parishes, for schools to help the laity get educated on this issue so that you understand what's at stake, you understand what the language is that's being used and really how the language has been corrupted. You understand how to express the truth. And then we have to have the courage prayerfully to speak up and be bold. Because what I've found is that for every person who speaks up and says, no, you know, someone cannot change sex. And this is unhealthy to encourage children to believe that if they just feel like the opposite sex they really are. For every person who speaks up, there are five other people who are gonna nod their heads, but who are too afraid to say something before then. And it's a tough thing to do in this cancel culture. Yeah. But we have to know the truth and we have to speak it. And then we have to prayerfully and compassionately deal with the person who's who's hurting, but with the understanding that true compassion leads them towards the truth not over a cliff because that's where their feelings want to take them. Personandidentity.com. Sounds terrific, Mary. You're really a light. And, and thank you so much for this interview. It's really been marvelous and very thank informative. You. Thank you for all you do. Thanks Great. very much.